Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. Today's episode is titled Designs of a Mysterious Universe, but I might turn it into Designs of a Mysterious Universal Sector. And so I want to speak about something great that is happening, something that is incredibly fascinating that's occurring that many human beings, uh, they don't pay attention to as often. You see, there was a point where human beings were fascinated by existence. Now they have kind of come into a phase where ha it's like existence is not enough. Uh, in, in some sense, what you do with it is the fascinating part. Okay, so first, just the fact that it, it was just here was just fascinating. Now it's kind of like, okay, now it's here, what do we do? Do you see? It's like we, we have kind of moved as a civilization towards a mentality where that immediate fascination of the world is not there. And this is because we classify data. It's like pretty much when somebody shows you different pictures of a tennis court <laughs> or like something, you know, you will eventually see enough of it. Not It's like you've... How can I tell you? It's like some things... The excitement for it can die if it's shown too soon. Another way of saying the same thing is kind of like life is a movie. Back in the day, people didn't have too many thoughts on the movie. They just watched the movie. Now, the person watching the movie has an incredible amount of thoughts on it and is even wondering if itself is in a movie. I remember I was having a, uh, with somebody very close, I was having a discussion and suddenly it came to a point where I had to spill the beans of my vision. And once confronted by a depth of kind of spiritual notions, you see, for me, spirituality is not a game. It is the most important question, you, not question, but it's the most important uh, thing to be studied how man is being the world, how the mind is being the world of man. So in some sense, when we want to understand the designs of a universe, we can't just uh, be satisfied and content with external data. We have to also see how this external... It's kind of like we are part of the picture of the world. We are seeing everything except ourselves, and we're wondering... This. It's like we're the last remaining puzzle piece, but we don't see it because we're being it. Okay? I find it's, it's a situation like that. So once I was confronted about spiritual notions, I just pretty much said uh, how I see it. And I said pretty much we are sight and there is phenomena happening. And this sight can choose to identify with the stillness and silence where all words and movements originate from, or it can choose to identify with the movements. If you choose to be a creature of communication, a creature of thought, I, per, I Mr. Within recommends you, you entertain the notion of an advanced communicator. If you want to go the traditional route of just trying to uh, separate yourself from a kind of... Uh, see, the ancient yogic method, it's not as... Per, it, every, every moment in history... Has, has phenomena occurring that are for that moment in history. Now, if somebody sees that same, it, it's like the ideas of the past are long gone. The ideas we have of the past are not the same ideas of the past. It's as if the world has changed too much and has changed our eyes too much for us to see the same. So there is this great happening called existential manifestation. Science has a bold claim. Science says the universe came from nothing. Religion has even a bolder claim. They say you, the universe came from something. <laughs> One person is like, it's very interesting. You, you can totally see how human beings are reactive creatures 
and they, they respond. They respond to the stimulus of the moment. So let's begin like this. Let's say we're a person, we're a cre we are a being that has opened its eyes in this world. Let's assume, let's take the playful route of thinking as if, we, let, uh, I call this uh, in some sense, um, uh, refreshing your browser on life. <laughs> like, you know, your internet browser, you, you press control R or command R and it refreshes. Similarly, I find that the person can refresh their moment. When they refresh their moment, they, in some sense, have to reverse engineer out of their considerations which life and them engineered. So it's as if your conditioning, who you are now, is something you have co-created with the world. Okay, some, some aspects of it are known, some aspects of it are, are unknown. The depth of your memory is unknown. The depth of your imagination is unknown. Even the reason for imagination is unknown. The fact that the mind simulates a linguistic world to, to consider, that, that seems to be too unique. I find the best place to start and the only place we can actually start, uh, at least in the world we have now in 2019, uh, is from our eyes. In front of your eyes, let us consider this external reality. Behind your eyes, let us call this internal reality. Internal reality is unknown. We don't know where thoughts uh, just come, like thoughts pop, pop out of nowhere and they come and though the brain is in some sense uh, there's brain activity lighting up in some sense. Uh, the neurology is a reflection of the intelligent process. It's the effect of, of, of a subtlety uh, which we cannot pinpoint. So what that means is man has suddenly recognized he cannot, uh, in some sense, create the tool that um, broke God. You know, it's kind of like The inner reality and the external reality, <clears throat> they bring forth different movements. One brings the movements of objects, the other considers the movement of sub subjects. Okay? So behind your eyes, you're most likely a thought, a belief, a series of language, or a series of images. Okay? Internally, you're composing yourself. Externally, you're already composed. Okay, so this uniqueness kind of makes us feel, okay, what was the point of this evolution that's occurring? And when we look at evolution, evolution is the eternal effort of a creature to continue. As if the creature is like, I'm alive, I'm here, I don't want to go. Like, it's, it's, it's rather changing with the world rather than choosing to resist and remain. You see, our unnatural aspect with nature is that we resist the world. You see, you don't see uh, all the other gazelles gathering around crying over one gazelle getting eaten by like a lion. Okay, you don't see that in nature. But we, we, in, in, in regards to the human life, we see that. We see that. We see the influence of the human being in its, uh, in its species and whether it is held in high regard or it is dismissed. There's many things. It's kind of like I, I looked at history and I was like, there is no way Socrates knew like people in 2019 are, were, were still going to talk about him. 
there's no way he knew. Most most human beings thought they were much more temporary than their words in some sense could carry them. Aristotle has a quote where he says, the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. And if our internal reality, what we are is a thought of self, okay, so we, we in some sense must entertain the idea of ourselves without accepting it, okay? If Aristotle was here, he'd be like, that's the way, kids. <laughs> you know? And, uh... <laughs> Sorry guys, I have too many tabs open, uh, so there's a bit of lag. I'm trying to change the song here. Uh, <laughs> I have headphones on. Uh, when I speak, I listen to music most of the time. I, I find that um, the free will is the part of this creature that is attempting to be its own governance. That means some part of this intelligence of the moment found itself separate enough to reconsider the moment. This was in some sense the first step of the mind, as if the animal stepped on its two feet, then the mind, then the attention. Then the awareness of the creature went into new heights. As language evolved, as many things came about, many various technologies, both external and internal, developed, suddenly the human being found himself in a world where he could do something. You don't understand, it took us four billion years to be able to acknowledge ourselves as a character in a story. You know, people think stories were there from the beginning. No, the world was not contained in stories. The world was more, mainly unknown. It, it still is. We just are so convinced by our knowledge that it's as if the explorations have stopped. It's as if we stopped searching uh, for other worlds the moment we, we accepted the world we were in. And it's a very difficult task because sometimes I wonder about this. Sometimes I'm like, what if the past was wrong and in our attempts to recover it, we have missed out on the future? I, I think of this. I think that in the future generations, when these children are going to open their eyes and live in this world, do they have to worry about how we lived or are they going to live how they are going to live? It is a decision every child makes in this world. It's like you want to see, do you want, uh, you, it's like you're, you, you're not free until you can be alone and not be alone. I'm going to tell you this interesting story. It is a story of how incredible the design of the universe is. You can extract that kind of moral from it. But it's a suggestion of the sophistication of the mind of the being. So anyways, it's this ancient Vedic story. And uh, let me see, how am I going to animate this story today? <laughs> Pretty much, there was a bunch of these disciples, it's a Vedic story, so think of like ancient India, yogic kind of culture, Vedic culture. And uh, in some sense, what happens is there's like these bunch of disciples and then there's this guru, this more enlightened kind of uh, 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 wise figure in the moment, pretty much like this enlightened sage. Uh, he looks at one of his disciples and he sees all the disciples are thirsty. So he looks at one of the disciples and says, hey, man, 
to get water from the river. And he tells the guy, like, uh, use your intuition to find the river, but I'll give you, like, I'll point which way it is. You know? So the guru points, and this guy goes to find the river. Eventually, the guy has attained uh, enough alertness and awareness and sensitivity to the movements of nature, where when the mind is natural, it guides itself. That's something a lot of people don't know. They feel they have to fix their problems, but they don't understand 70% of their intelligence. I, I give that number, but like, like a majority of your intelligence is involuntary. You don't think about it, it happens. So there's an intelligence pre-thought. Anyways, um, so what happens is this guy, he has a bucket in his hand and he gets to the river, somehow finds the river. As he puts the bucket, as he puts the bucket in the water, he suddenly feels like he hasn't even taken the bucket out of the water. He hasn't even taken the bucket out of the water and he suddenly feels like he has to look to his left. He looks to his left and he sees the most incredible and beautiful girl he's seen in his life. Most beautiful woman. And so what he does is he's kind of like overwhelmed. It's as if he's, he's seeing some sort of kind of like divinity in this girl so the man goes up to this girl and he says listen i love you let's get married <laughs> you know i guess the guy's direct you know <laughs> but what happens is the girl like back in the day girls weren't i guess allowed too much out of the house so it was one of those situations when an incident like like occurred like this maybe it was like it was important so the girl considers it and says, you need to talk to my father first. And I'm gonna, the girl's really smart. And the girl says, I'm, you're, you're going to talk to my father first, but I'm going to, in some sense, listen from the side of the door to what, your conversation. If, if my father gives you his blessing, then I will, in some sense, uh, let, let's do this. You know? <laughs> and so the guy's like, you know, he's in love. You know? It's like, what can you do? You know? So he goes. He goes and he's like, no, I, I'll, let's go. Let's go see your dad. You know? <laughs> and so what happens is that uh, <laughs> how the story goes is that uh, the man goes there, this kind of yogi, this guy who's been meditating in the forest, like long beard, long hair, you know, kind of savage, wild man look, you know. <laughs> and he suddenly goes there in front of the father and the father looks at him and, you know, sees at least like feels he doesn't feel threatened or anything from the guy. So in some sense, he feels like. He tells the guy, so tell me, what's your education? <laughs> and the guy's like thinking, oh my God, education, I'm a yogi. Like, what should I say? And he's like, I have studied enough psychology to teach, you know? And uh, the father's like, okay, and they have a discussion. And suddenly the father sees he's actually a good guy or whatever. And so the father says, okay. But the father gives him a condition. And at this point, he's totally forgotten about the bucket and the guru. Like, everybody's thirsty back there. You know, so he's totally forgotten about this. And uh, so what happens is <laughs> he, he goes, um, the father gives him his blessing, but says, listen, you can only marry my daughter under one condition. I've never had a son. So you will be here as my son-in-law and you will never leave my village. And I am the Khan of the village. So that means like he owns most of the land in the village. So he says, oh my God, guys. I gotta move. Just hold on a second. I'll continue this thing. Ah. <sighs>
The father-in-law says you have to stay in the village and when I die you'll get all the land and become the wealthiest person in the village but you can never leave this village from this moment on when you marry my daughter. And so what happens is he says yes. He says yes because he's, he's divinely in love. And so he, he says yes and many years go by and he has two kids, a daughter and a younger boy. You know a daughter and a son and what happens is that one day, and the father-in-law passes away and he's living this happy beautiful incredible kind of life as if he made the right decision and one day one day him and his family are on top of a hill and it's becoming sunset and he's seeing something and it's such a beautiful day and you know as he's he's looking at this like incredible day with his family and stuff suddenly he notices something at the edge of the town and it seems to be water, waves of water. This tidal wave has come, which is destroying the whole village. And his house and all the property and the land and everything is destroyed by this kind of like tsunami-like situation. As he's there with his kids and his family, suddenly the unthinkable happens. One of his kids fall, falls into this water, into the tsunami. Okay? And so when the, one of the kids falls, the other kid goes to save that kid, and then the mother goes to save both the kids, and all three of them fall. And this man is there having lost everything. He lost everything. And he's there shocked. And kind of like, it's as if like there's endless tears for the rest of his life coming down from his eyes from what he has lost. Suddenly, in the depth of that chaos, he hears the voice. It's the Guru's voice. The Guru's like, hey, take the bucket out of the water. <laughs> Suddenly, this man realizes his, his hand is still holding the bucket and the bucket is still getting filled. He looks to his left, he sees nothing there. And he suddenly realizes the incredible potential of the human intelligence and the ability of the mind to simulate an experience while being present in objective experience. You don't understand. You're not just experiencing sensory data. You're experiencing how you are constantly readjusting sensory data before any single action is done. Before any physical movement, you don't understand how, many image, how much imagery and movement is occurring subjectively. Okay, and that has to do with your precision and pinpointing and pretty much eventually, I, I, I haven't spoken about this much in these talks, but I, I wanted to build up to it in some sense. I think a couple of years has been enough. <laughs> and so <clears throat> the notion is, the notion that the, you, a human being can have a geometrical relationship with first their imagination and, with their, and then with their reality. So you see, ge geometry does something that rational and logical people incredibly appreciate, I think. The same geometrical pattern can extend through many different fields, okay? So what that means is if I, I could tell you one thing unique, you know what your imagination and reality have in common? Their design. They both have design, but one is objective, one you can see, the other seems to mean some invisible room of sorts. If I tell you right now, imagine like a giant golden apple hovering in front of you, okay, in the air. You can imagine it, but you see your imagination is, you are imagining it in the room, but the a giant apple is not in front of you. Okay, so what that implies is that through a certain maneuverance and navigation of the attention, the plane of existence can be held in a way where there is phenomena in it when there is, that phenomena is also not in it. Okay, we, we, I find that the species has to take it incredibly seriously. We have to find, we have, you know, this is why I can't wait. I can't wait for this thing that's going to happen in our society, in the global society. It's going to be this kind of edge of no end of knowledge, like apocalyptic knowledge for the, uh, sorry, it's going to be apocalyptic kind of experience for the educational system. And conceptually I'm speaking, none of this is like in regards to physical disturbance or whatnot. I'm saying that 
every branch of knowledge is going to suddenly remember an ultimate truth. Our eyes are open on a rock in space. Everything we know about the world has been made on the rock. Just like how the caveman, our ancestry, pretty much took like sticks on a rock and slammed them together until suddenly fire occurred. Okay? The spark of a new behavior sparked a new world of potential. There will come a moment where humanity will acknowledge a geometrical dimension to existence. It's going to first see the ability of life to, uh, like your moment can oscillate and it, it tends to when many people don't realize it. Uh, kind of like, just like how your sight, your visual sense, if we just looked at your visual senses, okay? Your intelligence blinks. When you blink, what's going on? The world is gone for a second, for a millisecond or whatever. Okay, when you sleep, that's kind of like the world blinking, you know? I poetically say it as such. <clears throat> The data is constantly being present and not present. If you notice, the reason we experience change is because there is a different, there's, there's a fluctuation in state of being. Not only the cells of your body are changing, scientists or uh, certain people in the medical field suggest that uh, every two weeks or whatnot, the cells of your body actually change. So after a couple years from like, let's say from your, from your childhood to now, your body has changed many times. So if the physical, if the particles are changing and if the ideas come from particles, let's even entertain the notion that uh, neurons If the physical objective particles are changing, and if the thoughts of the being are changing, but somehow this being is saying, I'm still me from the first day, the uniqueness of the positioning of memory is very important. The memory, in some sense, is in the domain of imagination. It seems as if like the brain was this recording device, this recording mechanism. It recorded everything in its moment, whether sleep or awake. You know, I feel uh, the mind is doing things that the personality will always feel it's, it is unknown. Because the moment the mind chooses to be a personality, it is found in a divergent pattern. It, it, it's found, it's divided. It's as if one road has suddenly become two roads, but the person is a giant, so he's walking on both roads at the same time, one leg on each. <laughs> so what I'm trying to tell you is, is like, we, we don't understand the incredibleness of reality because we don't understand the value of our imagination. Because art right now, um, believe it or not, some people say, hey, let me tell you this, it's like first God died as for, uh, in philosophy, in in. in, in kind of like important philosophical circles, Friedrich Nietzsche suddenly said, God is dead. God is dead and man killed him. 
Okay, what that means is man stopped paying attention to the idea of God and started to pay attention to try to see if the world can be in a different relationship. We are creatures of change and the nature of the world is changed, so no belief can hold a being. What remains is experiential value. So if this brain is recording all this data, all this data in some sense leads to this co unique organized coagulation. Like, like how can I tell you who you think you are now is all that you're aware of in the moment. So you are the awareness of the moment rather than one specific object or one specific subject in it. It's a great happening, you know, whether we choose it to see it as a system or not. So when people said God is dead, Frederick Nietzsche said God is dead, Mr. Within is saying, like some people nowadays are thinking art is dead. When God died, art was the next victim, okay? And what that means is man began attacking the unknown. You see, the only issue with religion is its restrict, uh, strict policy on objective, uh, the, uh, on objective relationships. But the whole notion of religion is to take a person beyond their thoughts. The God comes to us as, in many religions as that which has no partner, which has no... Th there, is, there is nothing like this supremeness that is holding everything. That seems to be it, as if we are dust uh, in, 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 in the gaze of God, you know, in the eyesight of God, we are a dust particle. Like some people to consider like this. Okay, not with that point exactly. <laughs> but what I'm saying, like, I have, I have lived in, I have had the privilege uh, to live in countries where religion is incredibly important to the social structure and I've lived in countries where religion is not important to the social structure and both of them have advantages and disadvantages. The world in some sense that is traditional, like a lot of people look at uh, relig uh, the a theocratic countries, you know, so America did something unique in history, you know, it wasn't just America, but like America is, is known for this, Americans are known for this, that the state, uh, um, what was it? Uh, oh, God, I forget the wording. It's like the state, what, the mind of the state was no longer being influenced by fixed doctrine. Okay, when you look at evil, what does it seem like? It seems like a person who's not adjusting to change. That's what evil is. The person is just living in one world. Any person who lives in one world, you are in a fool state. You're in the state of a fool. That means if, if you are convinced what you see is the only thing that's here, the only thing that's reality, then you have not under. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say it that far, but I'm going to say like, you have not understood the presence of your experience prior to the descriptions that the personality chooses to remain in. Pretty much, I'm like, this is the situation. We're sight somewhere. <laughs> We are the eyes of this universal sector, and when we wonder how the eyes of the universe are open, we find ourselves, all our knowledge crumble, as it, as it recognizes, as if the foundations of order were chaos. And chaos can be, not that there isn't intelligent organization to chaos, it's just that chaos is the unknown. So right now, as I'm speaking to you, Prior to say I, I say the word, it's like unknown. <laughs> it's like people don't know what Mr. Within is going to say next, you know. <laughs> so, the designs of a mysterious universe are how attention is keeping the world in orbit. Study your attention. You will eventually come to an attributeless, attributeless presence of it. When you come to this attributeless presence, you're going to choose to believe things. You're looking still. When you can, you, when you can be somewhere and want nothing from, the, from a changing world, that is when the changeless uh, reemerges in the sight of man. It's as if I would consider...
that some truths transcend the language threshold. The language threshold is a concept where a being is having an experience where the current language technology at the time cannot account for. There's some things logic cannot decide because logic doesn't know yet. Okay, logic has, has to do with data that's uh, available to it. Scientists, their, their knowledge base is based on the way, a data that's available to them. Now, science has this approach where it wants to, like, I don't know how scientists are going to index the whole universe to kind of find a formula for it. I find that this is why I say children must be given the hardest problems just like adults because we are all in a bubble of our own knowledge. On a rock, it's like, think of it this way. You see our atmosphere. You see how there's an atmosphere. Think as if there is a subjective linguistic atmosphere, an atmosphere of language where all human beings are in and they can tap into this reality. For me, I find that children must be taught the value of communication. They're not taught this. I wasn't taught this. <coughs> when I say the value of... <coughs> <coughs> when I say the value of communication, I mean, I think life is like this. Everybody is drowning at first. Everybody is in some sense falling victim to a story that is fed to them of the world. After you get past this story, life will take a different turn. Life is kind of like one of those things where you got to consider uh, it, its potential, its simulation kind of potential. You have to acknowledge the void. This is, this is how a person can be content with their transition in this existence when they see how their values are in it. You see, for me, it's, it's, it's like a, a human being. You know why I think art is not valued in society? It can have two reasons. Either it, it is not being seen properly or everything is art, so it has no value. For me, the civilization requires stories, okay? Because human beings are functioning as stories. We are in an era of idea worship. And the reason I'm saying it that intensely is because I don't know what to do about it. I'm just looking at a landscape where human beings before were chasing food and actual physical resources. Now they are chasing the thoughts that bring them the most efficient resources. You know, we're all trying to find a way out of this challenge of life. But there were Zen masters like Matsuo Basho, this Japanese Zen master, who had this quote where he said something like uh, the journey itself is my home as if somebody was like why are we alive man and he was like bro it's not about why you're alive it's about the journey because the destination your mind can have a thousand animations for it trust me your mind can choose to see a heaven a hell uh, uh, nothingness anything the, the imagination has a sort of freedom in the unknown as if, like, if imagination was a child um, and reality was a child and both of them were a child of the unknown, you know, that would be one of those situations <coughs> where it's as if the imagination, the unknown likes your imagination more. This world, it's, uh, it's too fixed. That's the issue. It's like, you know that enterprise called escape room where like pretty much it's like this thing this kind of place where a person and their friends go and they got to kind of escape from this room and find the clues or something i find we're in a similar situation but in regards to the intelligence of our mind we don't know much we don't know much you can you can bring me you can bring me a line of the greatest scholars and the most intelligent people Okay, you can bring the, the, the people who have all the tests and the greatest professors and they could all give me an explanation for why the world is like this and I will in some sense look there as if I was never in that room. I would stand there as if I was never in that room. The world cannot be put into a thought. Thoughts are emerging in a world.
So we cannot be a thought because we need a world to have a thought on. Okay? So the world is here. So when we recognize we're not thoughts, <laughs> what occurs? The person understands how to naturally abide with the unknown aspects of their intelligence rather than just the known. There are, there are sectors of, of your universal mind that have not been remembered, that have not been explored. Your identity right now with your intelligence is just think about it. Right now, just think about what, hu what the human being is. It, it's a very fragile, organic kind of packet of energy, suit of flesh, uh, holding itself with, uh, with a skeleton and a certain genetical design, as if your DNA is the blueprint of, their, of your objective existence. <clears throat> as if your objective existence has a program, okay, has a biological program to it. And if you choose to see yourself only as, as the objective aspects of the moment, guess what? <clears throat> You're going to pretty much make your free will extinct. Free will dies when one side of the coin is chosen. I have, I, you know, a hobby of mine is to write science fiction. And In this science, like how can I tell you, a lot of science fiction is actually inspired, like the kind of science fiction I write, I write is inspired out of my experiences. I remember I had a dream about, uh, literally in my dream I was looking at a sky and I was seeing stars kind of moving in the sky. And for a second in the dream I looked at that and I realized it wasn't stars, it was kind of like, uh, like some sort of like my mind was animating a highway of kind of ships, you know, some, some unique thing. The mind animates itself. It, it kind of like, uh, this isn't a dream. Okay. So usually a dream is something that happens to you rather than you happening to the dream. Okay. I can say it. Um, I have created a term. I call it the pilots of consciousness. The pilots of consciousness is a kind of the advanced communicator and the pilot of consciousness. I want to share with you a, a deeper description of this. Is that the advanced communicator is very similar to the Buddha figure. Pretty much, there are human beings from individual intelligence, they're going towards a collective intelligence. But there are also beings on this planet from a collective intelligence, they're coming to individuality. That means it's as if there are beings entering this, phys this plane of existence, this, man this realm of manifestation, and <clears throat> they enter it with various, like, it's as if, like, different ways, like, water was kind of like spilled into a swimming pool, you know? <laughs> or like how in a unique way how art was thrown on a canvas. Like every person's emergence in the world has that quality, has, has this uniqueness, okay? We, we, when we value freedom of speech, we value the potential of the freedom of the mind, okay? So it's as if our forefathers understood, okay, if the mind of the children of the future generations is not free, their bodies are definitely not going to be free, so they're going to be a slave to their own bad ideas. Okay, and that's the worry. That's the worry. Trust me, in every generation there has been people who have wondered where the species is heading. In 2019, I find there's so many human beings that it would be ridiculous to assume that there are not subtler indirect movements occurring. What I notice is that I studied a, a lot of religions and a lot of, I could say, kind of remains of religions. So in 2019, when I go, for example, into a mosque, when I go into a church, when I go into a um, various temple, 
various temples, what, it, what I'm experiencing there is how the idea of the religion has survived so far. And you want to know what's funny? It's like in, in, in certain religious contexts, it's as if the prophet of the time came, I believe this was in Islam. Uh, in some sense, Prophet Muhammad, there seems to be a hadith, uh, a, a kind of like saying he has, where uh, he says that they ask him, like he, he's telling people, my generation is the greatest, then after me is the worst generation, then after them is the worst generation, and so on. So there has been a sort of descending of the kind of rightness of existential allowance for the entity. When, it's like when you accept re religion, you're not just accepting the notion that there's a God. You're also accepting certain limits of behavior and limits of expression. <sighs> Pretty much, it's like I could write, I could, in a sh very playful short story, yeah, it just came to me right now. I could say it's pretty much imagine like human beings, they have boxes over their head. All of them. Okay? And they're speaking to one another and they're trying to find one another and they realize that it's, it's like they have to take these boxes off. And so the effort of civilization is allowing. Okay? It's not just you, you, you should feel sad when there's a person doesn't have food or water. You should also feel sad if a person doesn't have vision. Because why else is the world here? Everything in this world is like paint that you require to use to draw your life. It's as if, imagine there came a moment where man could ask God one question. And he said, God, why, uh, who created you? And imagine God looked at man and said, me? Like, like Robert De Niro, me? You talking to me? <laughs> I'm joking, guys. I don't mean to be disrespectful. <coughs> <coughs> God says, I am this, that which cannot be created or destroyed. I am the exception of all phenomena. You see, it's incredible. You can live for life, but you will eventually see if you storify life, there, there's an opportunity cost, guys. There's an opportunity cost to every belief you have because you could be seeing something else. And so you have to ask yourself, where are your values in this life arising from? Are they only arising from how you feel, how you want things? Are these the only two limited streams of intelligence you want to activate? You want to just be a creature of desire. You see, a creature of desire is still more sophisticated than another creature. That means you can say a man making more mistakes is at least experiencing a dynamism of life that the man doing nothing is not getting. Okay, so even the fallen are ahead of certain who have not even fell. Listening is a divine art. I wrote a book called The Ancient Listeners. It's not public yet, but um, I wrote it in 2011. And the whole notion of, of it was that how it's like a path to self <coughs> and your senses. If you just pay attention, if you just sit and just listen for like 20 minutes, okay? If you just sit still and see something, just one thing for 20 minutes, just have your attention remain on a phenomena and watch it. Like right now, I'll give you an example. Uh, right now in front of me, I'm looking at a tree branch, okay? I'm on the balcony of my house, and I'm seeing the branch of a tree, okay? I'm seeing the tree in front of me. Now let's say I'm looking at one, co the corner of like the leaf of the tree, 
okay? As I'm looking at the corner of the leaf of the tree, I notice that it's like my objective eyes, they're locked on the object, like my sight is not moving, okay? I'm seeing the leaf, but as I'm seeing it, there's various ideas coming and going, as if our sensory data has nothing to do with how this sort of subjective, Im Im abstract imagination, the subtler planes of imagination kind of data functions. Okay, so it's as if like we are existing in two worlds that on some level there's a Rene Descartes caught on to this. He said it, the, the dualism, the mind-body dualism. Your mind is in a dimension of its own and your body is in a dimension of its own. And Rene Descartes was challenged. He was challenged by this very smart princess who came and said, Rene Descartes, if the mind is in its own dimension, what use does it have for the body? You know, <laughs> and Rene Descartes was like, oh shit, you know. <laughs> You got to, at some point, sacrifice your desire for your true self or you won't get to live a true life. You know, the issue is not a person has bad karma, not a person is unlucky. It's like a person is not choosing to walk in efficient ways. as if there's a staircase up the mountain, but the person is choosing to climb beside the staircase, the rough parts of the mountain, just, just because they think it's, that's the only way to go.